Perfect. Hello, everyone. Welcome in the Vlerit Business School Studio. My name is Agnieszka Drozdel, and I'm a learning and development consultant here at Vlerit Business School. Um, and I would like to welcome you to yet another webinar organized with collaboration uh, by Vlerit Business School with collaboration with AISIA, the International Association of Young Lawyers. AISIA is the only global organization devoted to lawyers and in house counsels. Uh, aged 45 and under, with over 4,000 members support and supporters all around 90 countries in the world, Asia provides international opportunities for young lawyers to network and develop. You might have joined us in one of our previous webinars. L lately, it was a cybersecurity and a pitching with our expert faculty. Today, I'm happy to welcome you back if you have seen our previous webinars. If not, welcome for the first time. And we are going to dive into yet another engaging topic, trends and performance management. It is with great pleasure to introduce uh, to you our uh, speaker of today, Kunde Wetting, who you will see shortly on your screen as well, a professor and partner at the Vlerit Business School, who is going to guide you through the topic of performance management. He is going to talk about performance management as this is something that cannot be emitted in any organization that you are working, like, even if it's small legal office that you are engaged in or big organization. Before we begin, I just have one very short practical remark. As you can see, this is a one way video. The sound is not enabled in your uh, devices. But in order to make that uh, webinar as interactive as possible, we have a little chat box on the right bottom of your screen. In order, if, if you have any comments, feedback to us, or any questions that you would like to ask in the middle of the webinar, please do not hesitate to use that. Furthermore, at the end of the webinar, we will have a short feedback survey when you will be able to leave your comments about the webinar as well as, in, as, well as suggest the topics for the next webinars. Are there any questions for the moment? If not, Kun, I give the okay, floor Okay, Aga, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy to be here to have the opportunity to share uh, with you. Uh, I think, indeed, is an engaging topic. Uh, I'm an, an HR professor, so the employee performance management uh, topic is the focus of today. I'm really happy to share with you some ideas, some trends about how this field has been changing. Because indeed, there has been some changes, there has been some fundamental questions about why are we actually doing uh, this, this kind of performance management approach. We have been questioning, let's say, the old school way of doing things. I will come back to that one. And I think it's uh, exciting times because many organizations have been looking into new ways to, let's say, reinvent the way they try to boost the engagement and the performance levels of individual people uh, in their organization. Okay, so the idea would be, and I'll try to see whether this works with the slides. Yes, here we are. So performance management reinvented. What I would suggest is to first have a look into what are we actually talking about and how well are we doing. Uh, then I would like to share with you um, some ideas in terms of how to make it more effective. What I will try to do is focus on how you can do that from a company perspective, but from time to time you will see we will also look into uh, the implications towards uh, you as individual managers, people managers working together with other people in your offices. Link with pay, always an interesting one if we talk about performance management, so we will not avoid that topic too. And then maybe uh, at the end we can have a look into uh, supporting tools that are available nowadays to make uh, performance management, let's say, a little bit more dynamic and maybe also a bit more effective. So this is the agenda uh, for uh, this presentation. But again, as Aga already shared with you, uh, although it is one way in terms of sound, I would really uh, be happy with your questions, with your uh, feedback, with your suggestions, with your examples. I think, although it's not very easy, I think we can make this uh, an interactive event. So feel free to add wherever you feel the need to, to share something. Okay, let's get started. Performance management question mark. I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm only a psychologist, sorry for that, I'm not a lawyer. 
And you know, psychologists are not always the brightest ones. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I would say performance management to me is a, a, a key process. And actually, there's two fundamental elements in there. It is about creating energy in an individual and in teams. But however, it's also about creating energy for the right things. And what I see is, and maybe you can reflect a little bit on your own role as a, as a people manager, um, these two are quite distinct. And the question is, how can you combine this? Uh, on the one hand, making sure that people get enthusiastic, but also for the right things is not easy. Some managers are good in creating enthusiasm, but have maybe difficulty in channeling it to the right direction. I also see the other managers that are great in giving direction, but actually no one is following. So fundamentally, if you would ask me how to manage performance, both at the organization level, but also as an individual, I would say this is two key elements, energy creation for the right things. And so let's try to see later on how companies try to do that. Okay, this has been, let's say the traditional way uh, or maybe we could also call it the old school way of managing performance in companies. And what you see here is the performance management cycle where you have a more strategic element, which is actually about the company top that decides on a certain direction, strategic direction that tries to translate that into objectives. And then you have this kind of cascading principle uh, where unit uh, or company uh, objectives uh, tend to be translated in uni in unit uh, objectives, which then uh, tends to be translated in individual objectives. And then you have the kind of relationship between the boss and the employee where targets are defined. At the end of the year, there is the moment of magic uh, where the performance of the employee is translated into often a single number. Uh, you are 4.3 on a five point scale this year. And hopefully intermediately, uh, there is a kind of follow up between the manager and the employee to make sure that things are going well. Um, I think there is still some value uh, or valuable elements in this approach. But what we also see is that there has been a lot of questions on this one because often, and that's also what I will show later on, uh, it has been questioned whether this is really the best way indeed to create engagement for the right things. And actually, maybe looking into some evidence from our own side, this is research we've been doing a few years ago with more than 1,000 people, employees involved. And actually, what you see here is just two questions that we asked them. And those questions were, uh, do you have the feeling that the conversations you had with your boss, that they were actually motivating you? And do you feel that they helped you to boost your uh, performance? Well, actually, what you see is there's good news. Uh, in about 30, a little bit more, maybe 40% of the cases, employees are happy and uh, they agree or strongly agree. Um, but there's also the other side to the story. This, this means that in about 60% of the cases, people were actually not very enthusiastic. And in about half of these 30%, people were neutral, saying, well, it didn't help, it didn't hurt. But what you also see in about 30% and even in about one out of five, people were quite very negative about these conversations. So actually, although companies are putting a lot of time into these processes, if you see that this is the outcome, yeah, you start, of course, wondering why are we actually doing this? I don't know whether this uh, links to your experiences with performance management, uh, of course, assuming that you would have a certain approach, more formal or more informal in your company, but at least uh, what this graph is showing is actually quite consistent with the experience we see in quite a lot of organizations. Spending a lot of time on this quite complex process, but actually uh, creating not that much positive impact with it. So that's one element. Yeah? Uh, the second element is, and this is Adobe, which is one of these companies that have tried to reinvent their approach because they also came to the conclusion that in terms of positive impact, it was limited and questionable. At the same time, uh, knowing that they have about 12,000 people in their company, they figured out that they were actually spending 80,000 management hours. I'm not talking about employees, but I'm talking about managers, line managers, spending time on the process. They came to the conclusion that they were spending 80,000 hours. I think uh, that some of you are used to think in terms of billable hours. 
well, I guess uh, it's very quickly done to make the calculation, having a process that is actually not leading to a lot of positive outcomes, and at the same time seeing uh, that we're spending quite a lot of time on it. So I think this is just a few elements that illustrate to you or that uh, uh, clarify why there has been quite some questions on this process and why, and that's a positive side about it, there has been quite some companies that have been reinventing uh, their uh, approach. Okay? So strengths, uh, there is some things which are still good about, and I think we still have the old presentation, but that's fine. Yeah? Uh, there is some strengths. Um, there is some strengths about the system, but I think there's also some uh, limitations uh, where you see that managers are saying, okay, it's lots of paperwork. Um, actually, it depends on the maturity of, uh, of people managers. Uh, people have to differentiate between good performers and bad performers, and that's not an easy process. So actually, some people manage just saying, I think I'm doing a good job, but actually this single moment in the year is actually destroying uh, a lot of the efforts I'm doing. Okay? So, towards more effective performance management, let me start with a few warnings, because for those that are expecting now to get the holy grail, I hope that I will be able to give some useful suggestions and some food for thought. But let me just start with two warnings. And the first one is that perfect performance management does not exist. Uh, um, I've never seen a company where this complex process and system with many people involved, with many, let's say, objectives in terms of what we want to reach with it, I think it's always about making choices. And that would be also my invitation to you. I try to see the input I will give to you as some elements that can help you in building your own cocktail that would work for your company. Because I think that's most important. I have a bit of a hate-love relationship with uh, company culture. The love relationship is about being an academic and if I get questions from practitioners about what should I do and if I don't know the answer, the good thing is I can always refer to culture and I would probably say, well, you know, it depends on your culture. So that, that you could say the love part. The hate part about it is, well, culture is a difficult thing to grasp. But I do believe that it is key. And that's why you see this uh, strange picture here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a psychologist, and you know psychologists like experimentation. And uh, one, one of these experiments is this one. And actually what happens is, this is just to illustrate to you the power of culture, but also the limitation. What actually happens here is we have 10 monkeys in a cage, um, and there is uh, some bananas in there. And you can imagine that the monkeys are inclined to go for the bananas because they like bananas, especially if they're hungry. But what actually happens if, if one of the monkeys is getting too close to the bananas, uh, all the monkeys get splattered with ice cold water. And I can assure you, it's not only lawyers that don't uh, like cold water, but it's the same with monkeys. So what happens, one monkey would say, let's go for a banana. The 10 monkeys get splattered with ice cold water. Second monkey, because indeed for monkeys, it takes the time for learning. The second monkey would also say, who banana, again goes for the bananas, and again, the monkeys get splashed with ice cold water. So this is a kind of learning process, which is interesting. But the more interesting part is the moment we start changing with monkeys. Because we take out one monkey and we replace the monkey by a new one. Imagine for a second, I don't want to insult you, but imagine for a second that you would be that new monkey. What would you do? Yes, of course, you would go for bananas. But you will be stopped by the nine other monkeys because they have learned that getting splashed with ice cold water is not a good idea. We replace the second monkey by a new one. We replace the third monkey by a new one, a fourth monkey, a fifth monkey, until the moment that we have 10 brand new monkeys in the cage. The funny thing is that none of these monkeys will try to approach the bananas. At the same time, none of the monkeys actually knows why. And that's culture. It has a huge impact on behavior, but very often we are not aware of it. And I think that's why I just want to make this uh, introduction before we go into the trends. I think company culture, although very difficult to grasp, it is something which can have a huge impact on how 
people behave uh, within the walls of your company. And I think it should be a concern to start reflecting on what kind of an organization do we want to be. But then the second step is how do we translate that in all the kind of HR processes and systems and approaches that we have available. So indeed, when we will look into the trends I will present to you, uh, I think the real question is try to think about whom you want to be and whether these examples would fit you or not. And hopefully at the end of the presentation, you will have some clues about, OK, building a certain culture in the company, knowing that these kind of practices exist, what would be the ones I would pick to further build my strategy? OK, so that's a long story, but just to try to clarify that it's about making choices. The perfect system does not, not exist, but it's about making or building that system that really uh, would fit your organization. Second starting point, before we focus on formal systems, what you see here is looking into characteristics of performance management and looking into the percentage of engagement and satisfaction we explain by looking into those differences. I don't want to go too much into the statistics, but actually what you see is that if we map performance management approaches yeah, and we try to explain differences in individual employee engagement, we only explain about 5%, which actually means that 95% of employee differences in terms of engagement are explained by other things. Okay, very important. So this is one element that can have a bit of impact, but there's probably other things that are more important. And I think this one explains you a little bit what the other elements are. Uh, in this graph, we try to explain performance management effectiveness. And actually, you see the most important levers to make the system more effective. And without going into details, what you see is the most important factor impacting performance management effectiveness is empowering leadership, which has nothing to do with the formal system, but which has everything to do with your role as a people manager. If the people manager sucks, yeah, then you see that average... Uh, Perceived effectiveness of performance management is 1.7 on a five point scale. If we see that it's a highly motivating manager that is shaping performance management, you see that performance management is about four on a five point scale. So this is the most important lever to make performance management more effective, the role of the people managers. Yeah. Second thing you learn from this graph, indeed, if quality of empowering leadership is low, actually the tree stops. So there's nothing else that you can do to make the system more effective. And I think this is a really important one. Okay, so main point, make your choices. That will be the invitation for the rest of the webinar. And secondly, be aware that the people that are actually involved in shaping performance management, they are key. Uh, and you will see that we will come back to that topic later. Okay, though, three trends which I want to focus on because there's many things, yeah, but I think the three, uh, three sorry, key elements are, first of all, collective ambition and fast feedback. The second one, development at the core. And the third one I would like to touch on is a climate, a climate of fun and recognition. Yeah, so let's see what it means. And what I will try to do is to give you examples from quite a diverse um area of uh, area of uh, industries yeah uh, and hopefully that will ignite a little bit of inspiration and maybe might help you and hopefully you might say well maybe we could do something similar in our companies too okay that's the idea just want to see any questions any comments maybe we need to take one minute yeah before we go into the trends just to see whether there is some questions because now i have a bit of feeling <laughs> that i'm talking to a wall and I would like to get beyond that wall to get a bit of input from your side too. So just let us hear whether you're still alive or not, whether there is any questions or just a small sign that would also be helpful, I think. Okay. And I see Claire is typing. Thank you for that. Still alive. Good, 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 <laughs> good, good, good. very good. good. Perhaps then I can ask you a sure, question in sure. the meanwhile, as we, since our group is quite diverse. So some of them working in a very small company, some yeah. of them working in very big companies. How then does the organizational culture work in a, this very small, perhaps sometimes two, three people organizations? Yeah. 
Well, I would say the smaller you are, the more easy I think it is to build mm -hmm. a certain climate in a team. Uh, because the bigger you are, the more heritage mm -hmm. you have, the more legacy you have, probably the more formalized mm -hmm. systems you have. So what you typically see is big wants to be small mm -hmm. uh, because they miss that kind of agility. Often you see small wants to be big, mm -hmm. but I think uh, the smaller you are, the more easy it is. The more easy uh? it is. So, I mean, and, and so there's good things and bad things mm -hmm. about both sides. Okay, uh? perfect. Maybe the bigger you are, the more resources you m could mm -hmm. make available. But of course, in terms of changing a culture, mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit more difficult. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Loud and clear. Thanks. Everything fine. Still alive and interesting. Thank you. Great to know. So, yeah. Okie dokie. Good to see that you are still there. <laughs> Hello from Rome. Well. Hello welcome. from Ghent. Yeah. Welcome to Ghent. <laughs> Perhaps we can continue. If yes. there are still any questions, we will make sure to tackle them either throughout the webinar or at the end. Yeah, feel free. Uh, we'll just continue with the trends and feel free to add whatever comment you want to make. Okay, but let's start with collective ambition and fast feedback. Yeah, what I do see is that more and more organizations, and there is quite some evidence for that, but I will skip that part. But there is quite some evidence that working with individual goals, although I do believe it is important to create um, clarity for expectations towards individual people, what we do see is that having a team of people that know where to go to and that feel that their colleagues are committed to go for the same thing, that this is really a, a very important factor to engage people. And I think many companies are trying to do that, but they do it in different ways. Some go for the moral mission. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether you have the opportunity to do so. Maybe it's a bit more the big ones. And that's mm -hmm. then the example of where sometimes size matters a little bit. Yeah. But some really try to convince people and try to engage, engage them by telling them, you know what, actually, uh, we are one way or the other changing the world. And we want you to contribute to that. Yeah, meaningfulness is becoming more and more and more important, especially for the young generation. And so some companies are really tapping into that. You see the example there. The question is, what company are we talking about eh? to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful? And let's see who wins this contest. Which company are we talking about? Any suggestions? Now we can really check eh, whether you're still alive. <laughs> Yes, indeed, Google, yeah, Go this is what they want to do. And this is how they try to convince people to start working for them, okay? So that's one way, the moral mission. Tesla would be another one. There's other companies that really try to look into, okay, uh, what is the purpose? What, why are we actually here? And how can you link that to the individual people's energy, okay? Others just go for more the convincing business mission. If I look into the big four consultancy firms, I mean, okay, there is a bit of purpose, but actually it's mainly about, we are professional companies, we are delivering uh, high impact services to our clients, uh, and that's why we want you to join us. And by the way, we will give you quite some development opportunities, which we will come back to later on. Other companies are actually doing it just by being distinct. And by really thinking about, okay, what kind of company are we? What is the values that are important to us? Yeah. And they actually try to attract people that fit that model and that fit that story. And I think I have a few uh, examples of those. Here is the Google example. We're not going to focus on that one that much longer. The Tesla, right? Yeah. They are actually not asking you to join the company. They are asking you to join them to accelerate the world in their transition to sustainable energy. Uh, that's about changing the world. Remember how Steve Jobs once tried to uh, persuade John Scully, who was at that time the big boss of PepsiCo, which was a huge company, and he wanted to convince him to become part of uh, Apple, which at that time was still uh, in a garage box. Uh, he asked him the question, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Uh, or do you want to join me and change the world? And at that moment, Scully scoped and he said, mm, maybe I need to give this a try. Okay, so that's uh, that's the, 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 the moral mission. 
This is a very local company, yeah, and it's uh, Durabrik. They're in the construction business. If you go to their website, and sorry for the Dutch, but what they're actually talking about is it's about culture, it's about collaboration, it's about doing good to other people. That's quite distinct. I can tell you there is many construction companies that are really suffering from the fact that they can't find people. Yeah? That's their limitation to growth. They can't find people that want to work for them. In this company, uh, they're actually queuing up to become part of that company. Yeah? Every construction team, this is people that are actually that you meet when you are doing construction works in your home. You know, sometimes you're wondering, are they actually communicating to each other or are they fighting and arguing? Well, what they do in that company every year, these teams would go for two days to the seaside to really have an offsite to discuss with each other. How are we working together? Yeah, quite unique, quite unique. They really focus on that part. And because of that, they're better. They are more expensive, but people are willing to pay for it because of the service and the quality of their work. So quite distant, quite different. Another example, this is a nice one. This is a barbershop, three barbershops. Yeah, one in Ghent, one in Antwerp and a third place. What you see there is mission and vision. You could think, I mean, maybe this is a little bit exaggerated. Yeah, a barbershop and I mean, they're cutting hair, right? Well, in this company, yeah, what they really want to do is make the difference in terms of service. And the owner of the company is actually having five interviews with people before they would hire them. Why? Because he wants to find people that really are engaged and motivated to make the difference in terms of customer service. That's what he's going for. I hope you won't be the first customer in the Waco Copper because that's the name of the company. But he has hired people that never cut hair before. He would say, I hire for attitude, the skills, I will learn it to them. I can imagine in a law firm, that's maybe a little bit difficult. I would probably say that knowledge needs to be there. But in terms of the attitude that you're looking for, maybe there is some opportunities. Okay. And then ambition at the team level, uh, because now I gave some examples about companies. But of course, there's also opportunities uh, at the level of the team. And again, what you see there is in, in many companies, they're really focusing much more on managing performance at the team level rather than at the individual level. Uh, and one element, just one model that we've been working on, uh, what you see is high effective teams. They have a clear idea. I mentioned that before. They have a clear idea about where to go to. They reflect on how they're doing in terms of team functioning. They have strong relationships with respect for each other. Yeah? And also there's lots of energy in terms of fun, but also in terms of feeling confident that they can do a good job. Uh, that's what you see here. Some sub dimensions. Uh, if you would wonder uh, what is the things we can work on within a team to make it more effective, uh, this, is some, uh, this is some elements. I thought I saw a question popping up, but it disappeared again. Okay. Collective ambition, remember, by a moral mission, by having a convincing business mission, or just by saying, this is who we are, this is our identity, and we are looking people to fit. Ah, there I see. I love the monkey and the bananas analogy. This is why sometimes you need a brave new monkey who asks, why do we do things like this? Great, indeed, it's a very good point. I think if you are integrating new people in your team, we are sometimes too much focused on making them similar to the old monkeys. And I would agree, if you have a new monkey, give that new monkey the chance to question things. Great point. Yeah, great point. Fast feedback, right? Collective ambition linked with fast feedback because that is what especially millennials are looking for. Yeah. And what you see is in terms of performance management systems, I think we've learned that this kind of yearly cycle where we pretend that the world is quite stable, yeah, that we can set up targets that are still relevant within one year, and also assuming that a cycle of one year would be fast enough to really engage people, I think we've learned that this is actually not the case. 
Yeah? So what you see is, and that's, that's also what you see here, if we ask people, uh, the more frequent they get informal feedback from their boss, from colleagues, the more engaged they tend to be, and the more effective they would also rate uh, the performance management uh, approach. Okay? And then what you will see, but at the end I will come back to that, uh, there has been quite some investment with the HR technology. Uh, in the States alone last year, it was about $3 billion. Uh, new tools, new apps that have been developed, let's say, to make things a little bit more dynamic. Uh, here you see just a screenshot of one of those apps, actually one used by Google itself, uh, where you make it more easy for people within the organization to share feedback with each other, to clarify what the goals are, uh, and these kind of platforms could also help you, uh, let's say, to make it a little bit more dynamic. Okay. Development at the core. Um, again, linked to the idea of collective targets and stretching individuals by uh, creating a kind of shared responsibility about what we want to achieve. What you also see at the same time is that performance management in the past was much more about pulling people towards targets. And now you see that in many companies, especially also the big consultancy firms, they're actually changing it much more towards the question, how can we help? How can we help our people in terms of their personal development? Because what we indeed see is that this is the key to really get to real engagement, right? And maybe to illustrate this, this is a, a study where we asked, again, thousands of people, what did your boss discuss with you during the performance talk? Yeah. And then looking into what people found most motivating, actually, they were most happy with these conversations when the boss asked about, how can I help you to boost your performance in terms of tools, in terms of training, in terms of development, in terms of coaching? So expectations towards professional development. And when also the second question was asked, how do you see yourself evolving and how could I contribute to that? And so I think this is a clear illustration where you see that modern reinvented performance management probably is more about stretching collectively and supporting the individuals. Another example, this is a company tree finance advisory within the financial, financial sector. Yeah? Strong profiles, they also do placement. Uh, if you have a financial uh, project uh, and you need some extra capacity, this would be kind of company you would go to. This is their performance management approach. It's not about targets, it's not about cascading, it's actually about giving a mirror to the employee and giving the employee the opportunity to explore themselves. And how can they explore themselves? I will get to this slides actually in three ways. Yeah. What do you like to do? What are your competencies? What are your strengths? And what is the bigger plan in your context? And actually they give employees the opportunity to figure it out for themselves. They have all kinds of self-assessment tools on their intranet site. And the idea is that you explore that you try to get to know yourself and based on that, that you actually come with a plan. What do you want to achieve as an individual? That's why they call it Me Inc. Me Incorporated. The company would consider every individual employee as being a small company with assets, with ambitions. And actually what they try to do is to give you the opportunity to explore, to translate into a destination, to come up with a business plan for your own one person company and what they would commit to is that they would listen to you and that they would see in terms of the projects they can assign you to that they would say okay we will try to help you to realize your ambition and even if a customer would ask us we want this person on this project if we know that you need to change to another topic because it makes part of your plan we will do so and we will probably say to the customer, we know you like person X, but sorry, we will give you another person who is equally uh, competent, but this person needs to move because of the personal ambition. So actually, in terms of assigning people to projects, they would look into the personal plans and the ambitions of individuals. And they would even claim employees first, customers second. 
Uh, so this goes quite far, uh, but okay, it's some examples to trigger some reflection at your site. Proactive job matching. AE is another company. They are actually between business re-engineering and IT. They are also working consultancy based with projects. What you normally do, do is if you have a new project, you would look on the bench. Who is the people that are free? What capacity do we have available? What they would do is every new project, they would ask to all the consultants, how attractive is this project to you? Score it on a scale from one till 10. Why are they doing it? The moment that you are free, they're building up data. And actually what they will try to do is find the best possible fit in terms of what you want to do and the projects that are available. So that's why I call it proactive job matching. I could imagine uh, in, in your world, this also could be an opportunity. Now, if there's new projects coming in, even if people are busy and they don't have time, you could ask them, would you be interested in that one? Yeah, how would you score it? And by doing so consistently, you actually build up a lot of knowledge in terms of what is the activities or the projects people would like to be involved in. Okay, still fine, still alive. Let's continue. Climate of fun and recognition, yeah. And maybe that's a bit of a surprising one. But before we go into that one, I want to give you a statement. And I would like to ask you whether you more agree or more disagree. And I know this is a bit of a complex statement, but if you see that one, I will just reframe. And the question is, happy people are not necessarily better performing, but if you're performing well, happiness will follow. My real question is, if you take the hat of the people manager, I give you two options. Or you would say, my job as a people manager is to manage performance. And maybe you hope that by managing performance, happiness will follow, well-being will follow. Uh, that's option one. Option two is that you would say, no, 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 no. My job is as a people manager to boost well-being within my team. And because of boosting well-being, performance will be better. I know they are close to each other. Yeah? It's not an easy one, but still I would like you to reflect for 30 seconds on that one. And I would like you to show color and indicate on the screen whether you would go for option one or for option two. Option one, performance first, which will boost well-being. Option two, well-being first, which will boost performance. 30 seconds to think about this one. And then we'll try to see how you feel about it. Okay. Option two, which was well being first, right? Yes. Claire is fast. Option two. Of course, maybe I triggered you a little bit into that direction. Could be, of course. Gulsum, Karim. Two. One and two. Aha. Okay. Good, 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 good. Can you repeat the question? Option one. Yeah. Performance. That should be the focus of the people manager to make sure that you create a team that is well performing. And because of being part of a well performing team, you will be more happy. That's option one. Option two is, no, 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 no. As a people manager, your focus should be on creating well-being in a team, and that will be the driver of performance. Indeed, it's not an easy one. You know, that is the difficulty of being in HR <laughs> and working on people management. People are unpredictable, yeah? but sometimes they do amazing things. Eh? That's the good news about it. Yeah? Seconds. Yeah, but I'm happy to see that there's some doubts about it, you know, because if there are doubts, we need to go back to academia and to see whether there's some evidence. <laughs> How late is it? Okay, 42, we still have some time. Let me help you out. First direction, performance leading to happiness. 
This is research and this is only one illustration. There's many of it, but just to make it a bit more tangible. This is research where they asked last year students at university, think about yourself in 15 years being successful. How would your life look like? There was two kinds of categories of students. The first category that defined success in terms of having a nice house, having a nice and preferably a few cars, and I would like to have a pink poodle too. They were actually defining success in terms of what they would have. Second category, people telling us, I hope that I'm still doing interesting things. I would hope to have some good friends yeah, that I can rely on and support on. And I hope that within 15 years, I will still have the feeling that tomorrow can be better than today. 15 years later, we go back to those same students and we ask them a little bit indirectly, how did it go? Did you succeed or not? And we only look into the successful ones. The havers that have, the to beers that are. And we also asked an overall happiness question. Overall, on a scale from 1 till 10, how happy are you? Again, only looking into the successful ones, the to havers and the to beers, apparently one group was clearly more happy than the other one. Which one? Of course, the to beers. The to beers are more happy. Because of several reasons, I think two key reasons are everything you have can be taken away from you. And secondly, the second type of people tend to enjoy the ride more. Okay, you can have a long discussion on this one. The only thing I would say, it's not necessarily the case that if you're successful or high performing, that you would be more happy about it. But let's go to the more exciting part. What about the other direction i need to build this one in two stages first we go to the united states to a nunnery which is young ladies that have devoted uh, or had, that have decided to devote their lives to god right and actually what they have to do is they have to write a reflection every day in their diaries and this happened long time ago before 1920. in 1992 uh, to make a long story short, these diaries were uh, being analyzed by psychologists that were looking into or that would fit the positive psychology stream. And actually what they did is they categorized the nuns, depending on how often they refer to moments of joy, how often they refer to moments of sorrow or frustration or things they didn't like. They didn't link it to performance levels but they linked it to something I would say even more fundamental, namely how, linked did, how long did these nurses, nun, 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 sorry, live? Actually, what you see here is they had four categories of nuns, negative ones, rather negative ones, positive ones, and very positive ones. And what you see is the negative nuns, they lived 86 years and six months. The rather negative nuns, they lived 86 years and eight months. What is your conclusion? Nuns live long right <laughs> what is the other conclusion the difference between negative and rather negative is quite small only two months difference the real question in this study was what about this one what about the positive nuns actually what they figured out is that the positive nuns grew 90 years the very positive nuns grew 93 years and five months conclusion Happiness helps you to live longer. And you could say, well, this is nice to know, but it's not helping me, helping me to boost performance in my team. Well, actually to build on this, there is quite some evidence that actually shows that fun and a little bit of joy not only helps people to live longer, but actually also helps to perform better. You all know the fight or flight reaction which is a quite fundamental human reaction if human beings get confronted with danger there is two options or you start fighting or you start running right not faster than the bear but faster than your colleague well there's more and more evidence 
that indicates that there's also something like the broaden and build reaction. And actually, lots of evidence, not only physiologically, but also mentally and cognitively, indicating that by creating joy and moments of happiness, actually pe people just perform better. They become more creative, they are more perceptive, they are uh, more open to cues, they are more open to disconfirming evidence, yeah, rather than only looking into confirming evidence for challenging their hypothesis. Uh, so to make a, short, a, a long story short, don't underestimate the power of a little bit of joy and fun. And what I see happening too often in professional environments, and maybe the law environment eh, could be one of them, that we're actually ignoring the opportunities this provides. So, can you completely ignore managing performance and should you only focus on having fun? No. But do I believe that taking care a little bit of creating an environment where for people from time to time they would say, wow, great to work here, nice to work here, I would say probably yes. Some examples, yeah. <laughs> maybe that could give some inspiration. Zappos is a nice example. Zappos is actually the shoe retailer in the US. Their value number three, what you see there is create fun and a little weirdness. Yeah. And you could say, well, this is an example of creating a distinct culture. And that's true. You hate it or you love it. I've never seen a strong culture where all people say, whoa, I can live with it. So they go for creating fun and a little weirdness. The core of the company is the contact center where people would be calling customers. And it looks a little bit like this. Yeah. Looks a bit, the pictures are not very clear. But what you can actually see is it's quite weird. Most people would say, I can't work in this kind of environment. That's fine. As long as they can find people that would say, well, you never know. It never hurts to be a bit crazy. And that's what happens in that company, actually. It seems to work. I'm not claiming that you, so, you all should imitate this. This is just an out-of-the-box example of a company that has worked on a distinct culture where fun is important. And apparently for them, it works. So, on a more serious note, and this is what you see here, mood measurement. And I think there is quite some opportunities and quite some companies are taking this more seriously nowadays. In the old days, we used to have the two yearly engagement survey. I'm not sure whether that's still a good idea. But what you see here is there's much more tools available now actually to real time and without people actually having to give input to figure out how the atmosphere is within your company. There maybe could be some legal questions here, but there is some tools available where actually the emails that are sent by people, the documents that are writ written by employees are actually scanned and where you would get an indicator on how much joy, how much positive words do we see yeah, flying around in our environment and how much negative words do we see flying around. Some companies are even linking it to what kind of activities people are doing. And maybe they see that the positive words are more in the front line, the negative words are more in the back office. And even a little bit more dangerous, some companies would even link it to whom did people work together with, which would actually, in a quite evidence-based way, give you the opportunity to identify in your company the energy suckers and the energy givers. Imagine. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we started off with some crazy examples about fun and weirdness, but I think, yeah, and of course, there, you, you could ask how far can you go in this also ethically, but I mean, the tools are available nowadays to really make sure that you have a good idea about what is the mood, the vibe, within our teams, within our company, yeah? and what can we learn from that in terms of improving it. Okay? So I started off with a bit of a crazy and difficult question and statement, but I hope that this could help you a little. And you see some providers, I mean, you can check those names if you would be interested 
uh, these are companies that are actually providing opportunities to measure uh, the atmosphere within the company. Moving, and we're getting closer to the end. And of course, I know when people get a little bit tired, we need to talk about money. And so that's what we will be doing. Lots of questions also. How much should we use financial incentives to boost engagement? You know what? The plan was to ask you that question. Do you believe in it or not? And I still want to give you 10 seconds to think about it. Would you go for performance related pay or not? To see whether again, after 45 minutes, you are still alive or not. Or 53 minutes. Yes, Christian would go for it. Probably. That's more careful. Johan or Loan? Johan? No. Karim, yes. Great. Yes, no. Diversity, this is what we like. Not an easy one. As long as this is one of the elements. Okay, good. Let me try to share my perspective and then I will come to a conclusion. Uh, actually, I am convinced that financial rewards motivate, especially to get more money. Rarely see people saying, no, I don't need it. However, you need to be a little bit careful because and many companies would say, yes, people want it, so let's go for it. There's a few limitations too. And we have been doing research where we see that about 75% of people tell us that they would like to see the link between their performance level and their pay level. Yeah, so actually, that could be reason indeed, as indicated here, to say, uh, let's start with the basics and let's make sure that we incentivize people also financially. Um, there could be good reasons to do so, but I think there's also some reasons why we should be careful. This is the first one. Don't forget, financial rewarding. Yes, money is important, but remember that this is always about creating dependency. If you do this, then you get this. And then you get this kind of situation where people are asking, why aren't you working? Well, I didn't see you coming. Yeah? Company culture is about how do people behave when you are not around? And creating dependency, well, actually, that's, that's not the, in, in the same direction. Second limitation, 75% of people tell us, I would like to see the link between my performance level and my pay level. Second question we asked is, if you compare with your colleagues, how well are you performing? Funny thing is, certain percentage of people believe that they're better than average. What percentage do you think? Well, it depends a little bit on the culture you're in. In the US, it's about 94%. 94% of the population thinks they're better than average. In Scandinavian countries, it's about 67%. So it's a bit less, but we still have a problem. Yeah? Of course, people tell us, I want performance-related pay, because they assume they're doing better than their colleagues, and maybe that's not the case. Even worse, looking into this graph, what we see is that if we look into objective performance differences, and maybe you can link it to your reality. If you look into, okay, maybe there's billable hours, but also, if you also look into the complexity of certain files that you have to work on, if you look into the really high performance, what you often see is that they're really making a huge difference. The high performers are so good that they're really much better than the average ones. And because of that, and that's actually what you see in this graph, what often happens is that the majority of people believe they're better than average, while reality might be actually the opposite. Yeah? I know I'm going a bit uh, fast here, uh, but that's actually what we see based on research if you look into objective performance differences. It is not normally distributed. It's not the case that half of your lawyers are better than average and the other half is uh, uh, less good than average. No, what you typically see is a few are really making a huge difference. And because of that, 
probably more than half of your lawyers are objectively performing lower than average. That doesn't mean that they're performing bad, but they're performing lower than average. And of course, what you see happening then is that you get a bit of an issue. While majority of people think they're better, now it turns out they're not. And why very often we would incentivize people by financial rewards because we believe it would create an environment which would be more fair. Actually, because of these dynamics, you op actually see the opposite happening. And then you create unfairness. And I think in the previous one, the idea was, and we have some support here. I just want to show you, and I think is a nice way to maybe uh, get closer to the end of the webinar. What you will see here is the power, but also the limitations of a financial rewarding system. What you will see in a very short video at two minutes and a half is the power and the limitation. Let's watch together. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, the, the, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. OK. I, I like this. It's quite, this one is quite interesting, so, right? So actually what you see is incentives work, uh, but till the moment that people feel like it's, uh, it's, it's getting a little bit unfair here. And I think this is just um, the way we should look into financial incentives. Yes, it can have an impact. Yes, it will move people to show certain behavior. But I would say you have to be really clear about what, it, clear about what is added value uh, in, in your organization. And the more clear you are, the more you can go for it. The more unclear it becomes, the more careful you need to be. The more you think it is the collaboration, the group effort that makes a difference, again, the more careful you need to be with individual incentives, I believe. Okay? So, um, I'm going to skip that one. It, it would lead us too far. But what I actually would say in terms of what is the processes that our companies are putting in place, maybe to wrap it up a little bit, what you see is that actually we see performance management becoming more simple. Less is more. Let's get away from this very complex, complicated, calibrated systems where we try to do everything. 
No, let's try to see what is the ultimate goal of our system. And some companies would say, we would be happy if our lawyers and the bosses of the lawyers, they can have a good talk together. And they feel that there is clarity about the expectations and they feel that they are supported in terms of becoming better. And so that's typically also how you see it reflected in these systems. They are becoming more simple. We are more going into uh, guidelines rather than following strict rules. And as an organization, we are more getting into supporting tools for people managers so that they can shape their people management approach a little bit more themselves, but that they get uh, uh, support and guidelines from HR rather than strict rules. Just about tech. You know Matilda, Matilda, Matilda you see her on uh, your left hand side, this is a robot, she's 30 centimeters high and she's actually doing job interviews. And the scary thing is that she is better than human beings in doing it. She can adapt the questions, she scans your eyes, she can make a pretty good uh, indication whether you're lying or not, uh, she is doing better than human beings. Jill Watson, very interesting. Yeah, uh, I forgot the name of the university, but this is an IT in Georgia, Georgia Tech. Uh, they are having an IT education program where there is tutors. Yeah, and these coaches are actually online providing support for these students. What they have been doing two years ago, they replaced one human being with a computer without the students knowing. At the end of the year, they asked the students, can you tell us who was the human coaches, who was the computer coach? The students could have, couldn't figure it out. And then Zoom AI is another tool where you see actually uh, they're moving from a calendar, going into a system where they would say, ah, but you have a meeting with the person with this kind of personality type, uh, we would give you this recommendations in making your communication towards that person more impactful. Just what I want to say here is there is three things that show you that in the world of HR, but also in the wor world of helping people, supporting them and coaching them, there is quite some impressive tech tools available that will help us in the future to become more effective. Can we replace people managers by machines yet? No. Will we be supported? And is there tools available? I would say yes. Yeah. And this is just uh, looking into one uh, company that is looking into tech tools. And that's what you see here. Uh, this is just for our country, but there's much of these ones also available worldwide. Uh, I think an interesting site, if you would be interested to go into HR tech uh, solutions. Uh, this site is also for sure uh, in English available. This being said and realizing that it is how five late? Past. Five past. I would like to wrap up. I Maybe I've tried to share too many ideas with you, but I know that you are very busy people. And I also know that smart people in a short amount of time want a lot of ideas. So that's why I try to uh, put the pace a little bit higher. But let me wrap up by saying what I would suggest you to do is that if you want to change the way you manage performance in your company, I guess you figured out that you can go beyond the traditional performance management approach. Uh, I would also say that there's no uh, one size solution that fits all but that you really have to look for something specific that would fit your culture and that you have to be explicit about that one. I hope that the three trends in terms of collective ambition and fast feedback, development in the core, and also the importance to fun and recognition, maybe that will help you a little bit uh, in, in uh, finding opportunities to make your approach a little bit stronger. Uh, in terms of the link with pay, I would suggest uh, to be careful with it and to really think about how you can make it work. But above all, I would say, uh, I think it is important to empower line managers, uh, to give them the opportunity to grow in their people management role, to give them a mirror so that they can become better in it. Uh, and bottom-up feedback could be one of those mirrors. Maybe you can also look into high-tech tools that could help you in creating a more strong HR and performance management approach. 
but above all i would say start the conversation about people management in your company because remember beyond the formal systems and the hr approaches the quality of leadership is the number one factor that has an impact on the engagement level of individuals um, and what i often see is that the people management role is a lonely one so i would hope that those people that are taking up that responsibility within your organization that you take the opportunity to sit together to discuss on how you can further strengthen your people management aspect in your job and i'm quite sure that that will help you uh, to become even more effective i would say in engaging people for the right things voila one hour and five minutes i hope this was a little bit useful to you Please let us know maybe a bit, a quick round of q and I don't know whether we still have time for that. I am available to you, but Aga, you're the boss, so yes. let me know. <laughs> so indeed, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to use the chat. We will be available a little bit after the end of the webinar. But in the meanwhile, I will already thank Kun for being My here pleasure. with us today. My pleasure. And for all of you uh, being there with us, uh, we hope that the topic was interesting and that you've gathered some tangible insights to, that you could implement in your respective organizations, in your law firms, in your, uh, yeah. Um, just a very quick question uh, there is a poll now in front of you that you will be able to see that you can see uh, please do uh, give us your comments and rate what you what you thought about the webinar also there are there is a field for open comments it always gives us more uh, information about what you thought and suggestions for the next webinar topic so please do not hesitate to leave some suggestions for the topics that you would like to see in the future so from here at Varic Business School in Ghent in Belgium, we wish you a great evening, a great rest of the day, and we hope to see you again. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you.